I wanted to share with you some greetings from uh, a couple that is often with us and desired to be here this year. Uh, Helen Fitch and her husband Blueford. I always have a trouble. He, he we call him Booty. <laughs> so Booty and Helen Fitch. She had a, a surgery which uh, prevented them from com coming this year. They did want to be here, and I've been encouraged to see, as uh, the other brethren up there have been, to see their their growing faith, their growing participation in seeking out the things of the Lord. And if you want to write them a note, I or anyone from our assembly would be glad to take it back and give it to them, or we can get their phone number or address if you if you want to pursue it that way. But remember them also as you pray. She's facing some further um, developments with the surgery and so forth that, that uh, they, of course, will need God's grace to continue through. So It's difficult to sing three, four, even five songs when you, when you get going. Uh, one, one measure of the Lord's uh, very varied tapestry that he's putting together to express his glory. Amen. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then, these things we are writing that your joy may be full. See, all these things do result in joy and praise and, and a return of glory to God. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. What does this do? This enables that we are ready always to give an answer to every man that asks for a reason of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear, or with gentleness and reverence. So the testimony, the answering to every man is conditioned upon that we are able to sanctify the Lord God in our heart. In other words, we are prepared to give this answer, and then when we do so, we are doing so in a manner that uh, bespeaks of our Lord and of who we are in Christ. It's been mentioned by several of, of one beggar telling another where to find the bread. I, that reminded me of the story in 2 Kings. There were four lepers. Amen. Remember the time? There, there was a siege of the city of Samaria by the Syrians. Now, these were actually worse than beggars. These were not even allowed inside the gate. Yeah. They, were, they, were, uh, they were unclean. They were, they were pretty much left on their own to die or whatever. They, 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 said, they talked among themselves, and they said, well, we're going to die if we sit here. We're going to die if we go in the city because they won't feed us. And we'll probably die if we go to the Syrians, but we don't know them. So they went over there, and of course the Lord had caused the Syrians to flee, and they found much abundance there. They came to the uttermost part of the camp. They went in, they ate, they drank, they took some silver and gold and clothing and carried all these things out and hid them. But then they began to realize that this was not the, the best thing to do. They said, this day is a day of good tidings. This, this, why are we holding our peace? If we stay till morning, some mischief will come on us and let us go and tell the king's household. And he, of course, and the rest of the city, the spirit of the Lord is me, you. Individuals characterized by these same symptoms of lifelessness, the dry bones. Well, we could say D, any of the above. Uh, it, is, it is one more chronicle of his glory and how in all the many different speakers we've had that have been through different passages, this is God again displaying, bringing life from death. He's doing, he's doing this in the midst of the valley. Which valley is he talking about, or does it really matter? Isaiah saw a valley of vision, and this prophesied of a day of trouble, a treading down, perplexity, breaking down, and crying. So surely this valley where these bones are is a valley of the shadow of death. It's a valley that resulted from sin and from its wages to the earth's inhabitants. Surely it's a low place, but there's hope. Because of all these things, it is a valley in which God can work and do a mighty work. It's a valley that he can exalt and fill. Remember, he's not a God of the hills only, but of the valleys also. Amen. This is a large project. This is a valley that was full of bones. I say was, is, I'm going to use those interchangeably. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to our circumstance on the earth and God's work among us. A valley full of bones, very dry, very many a large project. Think of other instances in scripture in which life was imparted to the dead. Some in the uh, old covenant scripture writings and some in the gospels. Maybe possibly even Paul himself. Think of the man that touched the bones of Elijah when he was cast into his grave and was raised up. What about the widow of Nain's son or Jairus' daughter when they were raised? These were all just dead as in just then 
or that day. Think about even the raising of Lazarus. He, they said, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days. These bones have been out in this place a long time. The complications are present as the question is given. He said unto me, in verse 3, Son of man, can these bones live? He's asking the same question that Jesus asked many times. He's saying, believest thou this? So this is not a rhetorical question. This is actually one that we are desired or required even to answer. This is given to us many times as a test of our faith. Believest thou this? And we answer, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe. Verse 3, second part, And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Thou knowest. You know. This is the right answer. This is a good answer. This is one that gives honor and authority and glory to the one who has my time in his hands. Thou knowest. This encompasses, too, what we comprehend concerning the foreknowledge of God and any of his working in predestination. It says that he is working all things for the good pleasure of his will. And when we say thou knowest, or you know, we are assenting to this. Think of another story with me. This is, this is akin to the response exhibited by Jehoshaphat. And he was with the, the men of Judah. They were gathered together and desiring help from the Lord against the armies of Moab and Ammon. He prayed, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. Uh, it's been mentioned how through the scriptures they're, they're the same, repeated again and again. Listen again as we go through this. O Lord God of our fathers, he's covering those in the covenanted people. Art thou not God in heaven, all the heavenly beings? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? There are none else. God is ruler of all. He is giving God the glory. We have no might against this great company that comes against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So this is the position that we want to be in. This is the one that advantages us to see God working. He's working, but this is where we want to be, to see it. Call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. What was Ezekiel saying? Show me your glory. Verse 4. The breath. Again, he said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Here we see the third person of the Godhead coming in, now involved. He is glorifying the Father on the earth. He is finishing the work given him to do. His work then is to impart life to as many as the Father is going to give him. This is the work of the gospel. This is the proclamation of good news and the power of God to salvation. Faith is coming here by hearing the word of God, the word which is able to save the soul when received with meekness and fear. Amen. Verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. All these things that he's doing, again, to a purpose. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. This is giving glory to God. Amen. What are these things spoken to the dry bones? Are they not promises? Yes. Amen. He says, I will, and ye shall. So a transformation is coming forth as a result of God's desire, God's intention, God's purpose, as the one who is bringing life from death. Mm -hmm. He has commanded, commanded, the light to shine out of darkness. He has quickened those dead in trespasses and sins. He has quickened them and raised them up together with Christ. The life. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Amen. Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. 
Yes, he is bringing many sons to glory. There was a noise and a shaking. Transformation comes by a movement of God to effect change, and often it is accompanied by a visible or even an unsettling circumstance. After that, you have suffered a while to make you perfect, to establish, strengthen, and settle you. This is the path by which life comes. The outcome, though, is life. Christ, after the travail of his own soul, became the firstborn among many brethren. And this same power that brought Christ from the dead is able also to make us alive. The sinews in the flesh and the skin came upon the bones. The filling out of the voids. The outward enclothing as a result of the breath being breathed in. The new creation, the new man, Christ formed in you, the hope of glory. These things, as we speak of sinews, flesh, and skin, may be representative of a few things I've listed and many more. Being an able minister of the gospel, receiving adoption as sons, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, being made free to obey the truth, becoming servants to righteousness, delighting in God's ways day and night, desiring to seek the things that are above, sowing to the Spirit, evidencing fruit of the Spirit, having a love for all the saints, and being fitly joined together and growing up unto a holy temple in the Lord. These are the things that God is able to do as life is breathed in. Verse 11, Then he said unto me, speaking of the glory, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost and we are cut off. With men it is impossible, they said. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This is a greater promise than the one spoken of concerning the exodus even from Egypt into Canaan. Remember, many there turned back from unbelief, but there is new strength given in this promise to those who believe. We are not of those who draw back unto destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says Amen. the Lord. Amen. And I wanted to read several verses also from Psalm 89 concerning the one who has brought us life, beginning in the middle of verse 19. I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, and mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him, and I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Amen. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers, he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Remember, he chastens those whom he loves. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Amen. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. And to this we say, Amen. Amen. Ye shall live, 
Why? We're reminded why we shall live in 1 Peter 4.2, that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. You shall know that I am the Lord. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we know that all glory originates with and emanates from God and then is bestowed or is shown with the result that his glory is magnified and increased. We thank him for that. I wanted to go ahead and introduce the uh, next speaker, my, my 